So let's talk about the small stuff, how the brain and the spinal cord all that's made up, all those nerve cells. We have two main types of nerve cells. We have neurons, those are the proper nerve cells, sort of. The ones we think they do what we think they need to do. Those are the ones that receive a stimuli, they process them, and they conduct impulses. And then we got glial cells or neuroglial cells, and those are support cells. They provide the neurons with nutrients and physical support. They also are part of the immune system, and they also are those Schwann cells that insulate the nerves. So these things are actually neuroglial cells that help the neurons function. Important is that the neurons uh, are not dividing throughout life, or most of them, and they can be replaced by glial cells which do divide throughout life. So when a neuron dies or so, then it's replaced by the glial cells. But they're not functioning as far as in terms of what we consider neuron functioning. Although some, some neurons are um, regenerative at this point, but we're working on that, I think, which ones are. And when we look at neurons, they're structural and functionally very uh, different. They're independent units. We have about 20 to 50 billion in the brain, so there's a lot of them. And uh, they connect to other neurons, to muscles, or to glands. I was said that before. And they do that by so-called synapses. So the, the, the gap, really, at the end of the day, there's a gap in here between the pre-descending neuron, the pre-neuron, has a gap, has a synapse then with the receiving neuron, here's a neuron, it could be a muscle now, or a gland, and then that's called the postsynaptic um, uh, neuron in this situation. So the synapse is that connection. Size and shape greatly vary, look at all these, these are totally different looking things, they're all neurons. They all have a few things that we understand and we can study. They have a cell body, they have dendrites, and they have an axon. They all have that. Oh look, here we, the, the colors are starting. <laughs> Bless you. The underlying colors are starting. So the dendrites are the branching processes that receive stimuli from other neurons, transmitting them then to the soma. Those are those localized impulses that we get. Then the soma is the cell body, and that's the metabolic center. So all the stuff is made in here. And then the axon is the, um, the conducting impulse um, projection that goes up to about 100 centimeters, that goes from the body to the effector organ. And again, that could be an outer nerve, a muscle, or a gland. The area here is that axon hillock that is the narrow base where we start the impulse. So that's where that flip is, that threshold needs to happen there. Neuron classification. Okay. When we look at, we saw the neurons look vastly different from one another. So we start classifying them a little bit. And for us, important are these three classifications here, uh, more or less. We have some neurons that are classified as multipolar. Oops. Multipolar. They are having one nucleus and many different poles that come off of, many different branches that come off of that nucleus. I mean, that cell body, sorry. That's multi. Those are many dendrites and one axon arise from the soma. The soma is also known as the cell body. They're most numerous neuron types and they're the most major neuron in the central nervous system. So if a neuron starts in the central nervous system, its cell body is in the central nervous system, most likely it's a multipolar neuron. Then we got bipolar neurons. Bi is two. So those are neurons that have a cell body and they have one extension on one side and one extension on the other side. 
One extension is going to be the dendrite, and the other extension is going to be the axon. They are very infrequent. We have them in the eye, and we have them in the nose. They're very rare, found in the nose and the eye. They're receiving neurons. So those are neurons that pick up the light or pick up odor. So they're receiving neurons. Now, I shouldn't say the word receiving because we just used it on the other side. What we really should say here is sensory. That is sensory neurons for smell and sight. These up here are mostly our motor neurons. So those are the neurons that send information from the brain out to the body. The sensory neurons are the ones that pick up things from the receptors. And here it's the nose, it's the, the smell and the sight. And then we got this last one here that we care about, the sudi unipolar neuron. And uni means one. And that is a neuron that has a cell body and then has one extension that goes into the cell body. Not two, just one. And from there, we have one that goes, uh, an extension that reaches back and one forward, and then it's the dendrite or the axon from that perspective. So that would be the dendrite, that would be the axon. And they are called pseudo-unipolar because they start as these kind of neurons. Well, let me go back. These neurons are the ones that pick up all the sensory information from the body. So from our perspective, these are sensory neurons other than nose and eye, just sort of put them in a bigger category. And the reason why they look this way is because they started out as bipolar neuron, and then evolution sort of, well, the cell body is the most vulnerable part of the, of the neuron, most likely, where we have all that metabolic center and all that stuff is happening. The cell bodies of motor neurons, the ones that send information out, they're all in the coast, in the brain, and in the spinal cord. They're pretty well protected there. But the cell neurons that bring information in, those cell bodies are in the periphery. They're not necessarily inside enclosed spaces where you've got bone around it. And so in order to be not too vulnerable, those cell bodies say, hey, can we cluster all together and not be just individual neurons along the chain and we get squeezed easily and all that? And they end up doing it. So now you've got all these sensory neurons that bring information from the outside into the, into the brain and spinal cord. And at the spinal cord level, all these cell bodies, they go to the same place, they cluster together and they sit together there and they are bigger in numbers or more protected in bigger numbers. And so that's why evolution made those unipolar neurons. So they started as bipolars, and then the cell body moved off of that um, extension. There you go, that's the classification that we care about. Multipolars are motors, bipolars and pseudo-unipolars are sensory neurons. Well, that brings me to the connection from neuron to, some, to the other thing, the neuron or the muscle or the gland. That's done by a synapse. So the action potential is gonna, is gonna send a signal down all the way, or the, the signal, the action potential travels all the way down the axon until it comes to the end. That's the end of the axon of the neuron that sends the impulse. And at the end there, it has a little club-shaped looking thing, a little, a little expansion, a swelling. And in that swelling, it got little vesicles with chemicals inside. And those chemicals are like your hormones. Now they're just neurotransmitters, but they're chemicals. And when the electricity comes down, it tells these vesicles with the chemicals in to fuse with the membrane down here, the cell membrane, and release the chemicals to this place in between it and the next recipient, the recipient, which is a muscle, a nerve, or a leg. 
And so then the chemical attaches to receptors on those, the recipient, and then that has a reaction in the recipient. Now the reaction will be a muscle is react is contracting. That could be a reaction. That's the way the nerve talks to a muscle. But it could also be like a light bulb goes up and you understand the action potential all of a sudden, and then that's a lot of that. So we have to give this stuff some names. So the first name here is the um, no, where was that? The axon terminal. Let's just read this. Once the action potential reaches the end, the nerve or the synapse transmission is the next step. In most cases, the neurotransmitter, the chemical agent, will deliver the message to the next neuron muscle gland. There are many different neurotransmitters. Oh, see, I forgot some stuff. There are many different neurotransmitters, including acetylcholine. That's the one that talks to the muscle, the skeletal muscle. That's the one we talked about it already. Then we got glutamate, we got GABA, we got norepinephrine, you know, that adrenaline stuff. We got serotonin, that's the thing that makes you sleepy at night. We got the endorphins, that's the feel good after you run around the block. That kind of stuff, that's what it is. And so those are all different chemicals. And so when an action potential comes down, we get the chemical released from the axon terminal in through the presynaptic membrane. So now we give this a term. This is the presynaptic membrane. The presynaptic neuron is right here. Pre means before. All right. From there, then, we have a narrow gap, which is the synaptic cleft, and that's the space that these chemicals get released into. So there's a physical space. And then from that physical space, we get to the receptors and those receptors are on the post-synaptic membrane, and that's the recipient area. And post is the after. That's why the US Post is the postal service, is the after you send, write the letter, you send it to the postal service. You don't send it to the pre sale service. They don't do that. All right, just a little bit of the terms here. And that just described what I already said. So the club shaped thickening is the axon terminal. That has the vesicle in it. And as the action potential comes down, the, synaptic, the vesicles release the chemical into the synaptic cleft. And then the receptors pick up the uh, chemicals at the postsynaptic um, um, membrane. And then that causes either an excitation or an inhibition of this next cell. In a muscle contraction, that's an excitation. But through the whole body, it can be either exciting or inhibiting. And then that gives us this on and off kind of system. That's what L just is based on, basically. We have um, types of synapses. We have some synapses that go from, as the classic ones, they go from an axon to the dendrite. We call them axodendritic synapse. We have some that go from an axon straight to the soma, straight to the body of the cell body. Those sometimes, you, you know, it depends. If they're closer to the axon hillock, they have more to say. They have a stronger vote. So we call those axosomatic, and then some of them are axoaxonic. They go from an axon to an axon. Those are interesting. We're going to get to that in a minute. Because here we get to neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity um, can happen because synapses may be newly formed or disappear depending on the frequency of their use. So if we use an, a pathway, a neuron, a lot, let's say we, we, we do a flashcard, and we have, a, a, we have to learn what is this called, and we don't know that this is the glabella, but we have to learn it, we know it, we have to think about it, we have, you know, and we do a flashcard, so we have to think. We, look for the term, and as soon as we find the term, this here fires up, this pathway fires up. Oh, that's the glabella. And the more times you do that, the stronger that pathway gets. That's why we have to repeat all that stuff, that's why it's so boring. And what happens is the neuron that receives the stimulate makes the next connection, goes back and feeds back to the previous neurons, and reverberates and strengthens itself by going in circles. 
And so that's called a reverberating circuit. And that's what happens when we say in neurology, neurons that fire together, the connections we make, will essentially wire together. And that's the strengthening of that um, pathway. And in neurology, it's really not just about the neurons, it's about the pathways. And so we can, that's an obsessive thinking, right? So we can go crazy, have anxiety, get into panic, get depressed, have more anxiety, have more panic, have more, and we go in circles. But we can also make it till, fake it till you make it, and we can smile, you look and feel good, so others see you, they then smile, they mimic you, and they look and feel better, and it goes in circles that way. Or whatever, it's positive and negative, it's not just negative. And that's the fundamental, um, how to be happy, let go of what is gone, be grateful for what remains, and look forward to what's coming next. And that's in neuroplasticity, is, a, is the, the brain is very, very moldable, and that's what that speaks to. And we have shown, I mean, I got patients, they have been chronically ill for the one she over 10 years. And she's doing neuroplasticity training and she is feeling like everything is coming together. And we're talking medical stuff too. Like viruses and all that is all sort of going away. I have, uh, neuro, uh, I have people with fibromyalgia, they tell me if they do really neuroplastic trainings, their pain goes down up to 80% down from training with the mind, how are we thinking of things? And so, but the core of that changing in the brain is the fact that synapses can be made. Neurons can maybe not be made, but synapses can be made. Pathways can be strengthened. If we make a pathway really strong, whatever it is, positive or negative, it is dominant. If we use that less, we're gonna be able to weaken it. Again, positive or negative. And so when we continually, we can continually rework our brain, and one of the ways of really thinking of everything as an experiment of something new, where we have to change and understanding that's how the brain works fundamentally, will help us create that change. Yeah, it's power, we get more and more into it in the science. It's very, very powerful stuff. So I wanted to just briefly touch on that. So that then brings me back to another topic, a couple more topics, I believe. Blood-brain barrier is very important. The brain is enclosed in a bony casing. Swelling is a problem when you have something like that because the brain is also very soft. So if you swell, the brain will be pushed easier than the swelling. And so, and so the brain can be damaged by swelling. So often uh, pathologies, viruses and things travel through the blood. So we have to be very, very careful who do we let of the blood do we let into the brain and who we don't. And that's done by a blood-brain barrier. So some of these glial cells, they grab the capillaries right in the brain and they have these podocytes that they cling to these vessels and they create very, very tight junctions to not just let the capillary leak out in the brain, but to decide who we're gonna let in or out. To make sure we do not let stuff in we don't want to stuff in. Pseudopolite processes. Water-soluble substances such as carbohydrates, proteins require special carriers. Fat solubles can go through easier. Uh, but those special carriers are right in here. So that's why we have a blood-brain barrier, to make sure the brain does not get all these damn infections. We heard of meningitis before. Nerves is what we commonly call the cables. That's the funny bone, like the one we can hit over here, and then it fires down, right? And so nerves themselves, these cables, within them have hundreds of axons that can carry the nerve impulses from the receptor to the CNS and back from the CNS to the effector organs. So we often have in a nerve then, we very most likely have sensory axons in them, bringing information from the receptor to the brain, but also motor axons that send the impulse from the brain down out to the effector. They can share. It's like a two-way highway. I mean, it goes late, you know, in and out, into the city, out of the city. 
But the terminology is important here. The ones, the, the nerve that carries sensory axons are known as sensory nerves, but we also call them afferent nerves because they bring information up into the brain, they ascend into the brain. So that's how I remember, e afferent. Because the motor ones, we call them a efferent. Not afferent, but efferent. So it's like one word, I mean one letter. So this one to me looks like an exit. This looks like an ascending. So the efferent nerves carry information from the central nervous system to the periphery. And since most nerves that we talk about, not all of them, but most nerves have both sensory and motor information in it, they're going to call them mixed nerves. So when they have both afferent and efferent nerves, we call them mixed nerves. I know. Some, some that, like the one that only sees that comes from the eyeball, that's an only a sensory nerve. That's, you don't need to have any motor information going out of the eyeball. Well, that actually depends on. Some people can have to. <laughs> depends how they look at us. All right. And that leaves me with the nerve coverings. So we got this big nerve, like right here, that's a nerve. And it's got this covering uh, around it. We kind of make it yellow look at it. It's not really looking that yellow in the body, but. Nerves look yellow on the models. Um, that covering around that sheath there, that's known as the epineurium. So anything that covers a nerve is known as a neurium. Neurium. And the epi, epi means on top. And then within that encasing, we have like um, fascicles, multiple bundles of nerve fibers are known as fascicles. So they're like here, that's the green stuff. They don't really look green, but that makes it easier to see it. And then around that fascicle, we have what's known as a perineurium. And a peri means around. So that's around the fascicle. So that's below the, I mean, et, yeah, that's below the epi. And then around every nerve, inside those fascicles, we've got a whole bunch of neural axons. And they, together with the myelin sheets, are covered by a endoneurium. And endo means on the inside. We had an endothelium, the inside layer of the blood vessel. We have an endoneurium. So that endo is inside, epi is outside kind of stuff. Comes up over and over that stuff. So that's about it. We don't, I don't think I have a question on that. That's just conceptually that you understand. The muscles made the same way. From the little muscle fiber to the bundle and then to the muscle. It's sort of the same construction. And instead of neurium, they just call it mesium. Epimesium and uh, perimesium and endomesium. So you gotta pick that back up when you go to the next class. Good. And that's it. Look, if a nerve gets cut, that's the last slide. Then we're good. If a nerve gets damaged, it can regenerate a little bit. But only, as far as science is concerned, or we're concerned at this point, only where the axon is. So we're going to cut this nerve right here. No, we don't want to do that. But the axon can grow one to two millimeters per day. And how does it do that? Is it has these Schwann cells around it. It has these glial cells that make that, that, that fat covering the myelin sheet, and they can make a channel and help the nerve axon then grow back, you know, together. The problem is, you know, you've got to make sure all the wires go to the right wire place, otherwise you're going to move different stuff around, so that could be a problem, especially if you have to have surgical reattachments. The other thing I want to talk about here is when you have an amputation, Axons, now think about this, in an amputation or after amputation, axons grow in all directions, creating an amputation neuroma. So basically, the brain then thinks, though, there is still a limb. Because the nerves just go in all different directions. And um, because the Schwann cells don't channel it, they don't guide it because it's cut off. 
And that can be really problematic because the brain gets confused. And that can be really, really painful. How are you going to scratch an itch? Just, you know, just think about that. That alone makes me understand. It's not easy. Uh, but that's, I wanted to uh, bring that up with that. And I think that is it for today's lecture. Now, do you have any questions to this? Or are you just like, ooh, never mind? <laughs> well, the first part is really the most important part, that nerve impulse. If you get that concept, then we're really getting it far. The rest is just like, how does it look? Let's describe how it looks, you know. The test review is updated on your site too, right? I lost my printed Oh, we have some more. I don't have the third portion, but through the nervous system, I have it again. Yeah, yeah, so you can have more. All right, so then if you don't have any questions for me, I want you to work on your presentations. And I'm going to come around. So today I want to have some text. I want to have a little bit of drafty stuff. So we keep growing it. Because after today, we're going to have more lab model things again. So during the lab, we're going to be more focused again on models. So I want to make sure we have a foundation of what we're doing. Um, and then what time is it? Good. And I'm going to call roll in a half hour. So I want to be focused. And then who, who's got the test issue? Marvin? We need to talk to you. We have tests. And who else? And we. So we're all here. Okay, that's good. All right.